All right. Um, I think we have a sufficient number of people in. I'm sure there'll be more people joining us. First, thank you. Thank you for joining the webinar today. Um, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Ryan DiClemente, and I am the co-chair of Saul Ewing's Consumer Financial Services Litigation Practice. Um, I've been litigating FCRA claims for the last decade, and I provide regulatory advice and guidance to companies on how to improve their review policies and procedures as well. I've tried to structure this program so that there'll be some real tangible takeaways for you and your legal teams. For the next 40 to 50 minutes, I'm going to focus on FCRA disputes relating to ID theft and fraud and the unique challenges that these present for furnishers. I'm going to discuss some strategies for addressing these claims both before and after lawsuits are filed. The steps we'll be discussing will hopefully help you and your companies avoid future litigation and or streamline the claims that you're actually seeing. Now, before we begin, there are just a few housekeeping announcements. With respect to CLE, today's program has been approved for distance learning, um, CLE credit in Delaware, Florida, Illinois, New Jersey, New York, and Pennsylvania with applications pending in Minnesota and Virginia. As a CLE provider, we have to be able to verify your attendance. And so at random points during the webinar, we're gonna display and I will verbally announce two numeric reporting codes that you must record and report back to us using the CLE survey that you received in your webinar reminder email. And it will open automatically in your browser at the completion of the program. We will in turn send you your certificate of attendance once we've received your survey response. But please be sure to, to respond to Saul Ewing CLE survey with your numeric codes within five days of the program to get CLE credits. Um, also following the webinar, you'll receive a follow-up email that will include the links to the webinar recording and supplemental presentation materials. We're also going to have a checklist that we're going to go over today and then will also be included in those materials. Um, questions can be submitted through the Q&A tool at the bottom of your screen. Um, while we'll do our best to answer all the questions submitted during the webinar, should we run out of time, I will follow up individually with an email. Um, now for the legal disclaimer, wouldn't be a CLE or, or from a law firm without a legal disclaimer. So the provision and receipt of information in this program is not legal advice, does not create a lawyer client relationship, although we would be happy to form one after the program and should not be acted on without seeking professional counsel, I'm assuming they mean other than myself, uh, who have been informed of the specific facts of your matter. So with that, uh, next slide, please. Now, before I dive in, I wanna provide a quick refresher on some just FCRA basics. Um, as an initial matter, Congress enacted the Fair Credit Reporting Act to ensure a fair and accurate credit reporting system. They also wanted to promote efficiency in the banking system and to protect consumer privacy. These are kind of the tenants that underlie the FCRA. Now, as part of its regulatory scheme, the FCRA imposes several duties on those who furnish information to credit reporting agencies. You'll hear me throughout the program refer to these entities as furnishers. But only one of these duties to furnishers provides consumers with a private right of action. This is the obligation that furnishers have to undertake a reasonable investigation upon receiving a dispute from a credit reporting agency. This is going to be our focus today because this is what's driving the litigation. Failure to follow or comply with other duties under the FCRA for furnishers could still subject furnishers to action by state and federal regulators. So I don't want to act as if they're not important, um, but we're on, we have a limited time today and we're going to remain almost singularly focused on the reasonable investigation requirement and the litigation that follows. However, I do want to note uh, that federal and state regulators are extremely focused on FCRA issues, particularly the CFPB. For those of you who have not seen it or read the recent consent order involving Hyundai Capital, I would suggest you take a look because this highlights the significant regulatory risks that remain in the space and particularly as it relates to FCRA. Uh, next slide, please. Now we have our first code. I just wanna draw everybody's attention to the code at the bottom. I'm gonna read it aloud. Um, so write it down and you'll be able to report this back to us. It is 13579. 
again, 13579. So next I wanna talk about what's at stake and why these issues are important for your companies. Since 2014, the number of FCRA lawsuits per year have nearly doubled. They continue to increase in volume each year. Personally, I can tell you that these cases make up a significant portion of our clients' litigation portfolios. Claims of ID theft and fraud continue to make up a significant portion of the claims that we're seeing, and they present some of the most significant risks. They present risks of actual damages where consumers have, may have been trying for years to remove a negative notation that does not belong to them. And these cases often involve accounts that are in default and are not paid by the alleged fraudsters, which it can increase the risk of harm to consumers. Now, over the years, consumers have become more and more focused on their credit scores and credit notations. I think this is because they now have instantaneous access to credit scores and information through like never before. They can access their scores and notations through applications on their phone, like Credit Karma. I believe that the increase in consumer awareness, along with the emergence of credit reporting organizations, and don't get me started on them, have contributed to the significant increases in filings we've seen each year. Layered on this is the potential for statutory damages and attorney's fees that have led to a new cottage industry for the plaintiff's bar. The explosion of these cases have created a compliance nightmare for furnishers. And I think this is largely due to the uncertainty surrounding the reasonable investigation requirement that we're gonna talk about shortly. All, an, an additional problem is that inquiries into whether or not the investigation was in fact reasonable is often a jury question. It's difficult to dispose of these claims early on in litigation or even on summary judgment. Some of the most difficult claims that we're going to face in, uh, for FCRA claims are those involving ID theft and fraud. That's going to be what we're going to focus on today. Just last week, I was co-hosting a litigation roundtable with a number of in-house counsel from a variety of financial services companies, and all of them identified the FCRA as a continued thorn in their side, and the claims of ID theft and fraud in particular as being problematic. So today, we're going to address some of that and talk a little bit about some strategies that are aided to make these claims a little bit easier. Next slide. So before we want to jump, before we jump in, I want to start and set the stage and point everybody back to the statutory language that's going to guide us, right? And specifically, I want to point to subsection E uh, on this slide. And, and in effect, it reads that upon receiving notice of a dispute and after undertaking an investigation, if an item, or in this case, a claim of fraud or ID theft, is inaccurate, or cannot be verified, you as the furnisher must do one of three things. Modify the item, delete the item, or permanently block the item. We'll address this a little bit later, but I think this is an important idea to start with and something I want everyone to take away. If you don't have the information that you can reasonably verify a claim of fraud, the statute tells you what you must do next you must modify, delete, or permanently block the item. Now, I don't want you to take this as if I'm saying any dispute of fraud or an ID theft claim from a consumer requires you to delete it. That's not what the takeaway will be today, as you will see. But instead, if there is uncertainty, indicia of fraud in an account, and you cannot verify or reasonably verify the account information, uh, you need to do one of those three things. The statute is really clear on that. Next slide. So next I wanna talk about another important aspect of the statute. What's a reasonable investigation? Not surprisingly, this definition is extremely difficult to pin down and creates a great deal of confusion for furniture. 
Furnishers obviously have to balance the overwhelming number of disputes they receive and the requirement to conduct a reasonable investigation. Now, we would love it, as I'm sure you would, if, if your business folks could spend hours on these reviews, but that's not realistic. And your business would never be able to respond within the statutory time frame set out under the FCRA or frankly get anything else done. So we have to balance and create an FCRA uh, review process that accomplishes this reasonable investigation that we're going to talk about while at the same time allowing these, these investigations to be conducted with some degree of speed. Um, so I pulled together some definitions and descriptions that I think are helpful from various circuits. And I want to use this as, as kind of a jumping off point here. So according to the fourth circuit, the term investigation means a detailed in or systematic examination. It requires some degree of careful inquiry and a superficial or unreasonable inquiry would hardly satisfy Congress's objective. By its ordinary morning, meaning, the Seventh Circuit says, an investigation is not a cursory or sloppy review of the dispute. So when you go back and you, you, you're looking at your policies and procedures, I think those are a few descriptions that are really useful to have at the front of your mind. When you're talking to your business folks about improving your policies and procedures or your credit reporting team, these are descriptions that I always use to try to guide and judge how good our internal procedures are, or my client's internal procedures are. Um, next slide, please. So here's a few more. Um, the third and 10th circuits description, I think highlights one of the problems we have. A reasonable investigation is one that a reasonably prudent would under, person would undertake under the circumstances. What does that tell us? I think we learned in second and third grade, you don't try to define a term by using the same term in the definition. But yet that's what the 10th circuit and third circuit has done here. Um, I think it's really difficult to uh, talk to clients utilizing that type of definition. Some other circuits, including the sixth, the first and the ninth, will consider the reasonableness of a furnisher's investigative procedures as it relates to the contents and notice of the dispute that's actually sent from the CRA. So what this means is, is where a, a notice or an ACDV only gives uh, vague allegations or vague descriptions of the alleged inaccuracy, a more limited investigation may be warranted. So how does this relate to ID theft and fraud claims? Well there are usually two different dispute codes that are commonly seen in fraud disputes. The first is an 01 dispute, um, which is a code where the consumer is saying that the account is not his or hers. I've always treated that as a more generic type of dispute code. And I look at that dispute code and, I, and for most of my clients, it's one they see with greater frequency. I think it's different than a dispute code, which is a 103 dispute code. That code means that it's a claim of true identity theft and fraud. And, and I think it's important uh, and an important takeaway is when you're looking at the ACDVs that you've received or your team is looking at the ACDVs it receives, don't just look at the dispute code and follow the, the procedures, right? So don't just take how a CRA has described the dispute, but rather you have to review the attachments and the submissions to make sure that a general 01 claim is not really a claim for ID theft and fraud. And we often find this where consumers will attach a letter that gives a more robust description, but uh, a CRA will simply describe it as, as an 01 dispute. It's important to have your teams trained to review the attachments and get to the substance of what a consumer is actually complaining about. You're gonna to wanna to find out in terms, and we'll talk about a case a little bit later that addresses this, what's the nature of the fraud? Are they claiming that someone stole their identity? Are they claiming that a particular charge was fraudulent? Are they claiming that someone, that they gave their personal identifying information, but never actually went forward with the transaction? It's important 
for your team to understand what the nature of the dispute is and then act accordingly thereafter in taking their reasonable investigation. Now, I want a couple takeaways for the reviews to be, it has to be one, more than a superficial review. It has to be two, a systematic and detailed inquiry. And then finally, I want you to keep in your minds, it doesn't mean you always have to get the right conclusion. That's not the standard. The standard is you're not always perfect, right? The standard is that you, the investigation itself must be reasonable in accordance with the FCRA. Next slide. Now you're probably thinking at this point, that's great, but what do I do when I get sued? Well, the first thing you do is you have to know who your adversary is. Who's the plaintiff's counsel? If you don't know them, gather information from outside counsel. If your outside counsel doesn't know them, tell them to go out and find information on them from their other network of outside counsel. Um, it's an essential step because each of the plaintiff's counsel operate differently. And it's gonna drive your company's risk and the settlement levels. Some counsel are reasonable and will consider a reasonable early resolution without discovery. Others are gonna make it really difficult and aren't interested in early discussions without some type of discovery. Um, it's, it's imperative that you know who you're dealing with because it drives the risk of these cases and it allows you as the in-house team to understand uh, what type of risk this case presents. The second thing you wanna do is you wanna undertake an early case assessment and analysis. And that's gonna be what we're gonna talk about probably the most out of anything today is how to do that. And because this is the key to avoiding a long protracted litigation on these issues. We're gonna discuss how to specifically undertake that analysis in a few moments, but it is extremely important that you assess these cases early and for those cases that are problematic, you mitigate the risk. The next two follow in line with that, right? So the third issue is you want to identify bad facts and issues before discovery. It's important that you ferret out all of these bad facts so you can mitigate the risks associated by pushing for an early resolution where appropriate. But there's another side to that coin, right? You also want to do an early case assessment and ferret out the good facts, right? What facts do we have that suggest that this is made up? This is a nonsense fraud claim. Um, facts that support the investigation and conclusions. And you can do one of two things with that information. You can either drive down the costs of settlement, which is what everybody is trying to do, or you can create leverage with the plaintiff's counsel to try to settle these cases early, or in some cases, we've presented evidence to counsel and they've affirmatively dismissed these claims. So it's, it's imperative that you, you engage in this early case assessment in order to assess risk, drive down the cost of the litigation, um, and move forward. So next slide, please. So, this is what I indicated at the outset that we were going to provide as part of our materials. So over the last few years in dealing with these claims on a repeated basis, we've effectively created a checklist um, of the relevant items that our team examines um, or, or our, our outside counsel or in-house counsel partners uh, examine. Now, if you have an in-house counsel team that can, has the capacity to conduct these preliminary analysis, that's great. We have clients that put together a detailed summary of their findings based on the things that we're going to talk about. Outside counsel like myself and, and the others that you engage can also conduct this type of review, but of course it's going to be more expensive. Um, this checklist can also be used to supplement your review procedures on the types of items that can and likely should be considered in a fraud dispute review. Now, I want to have everyone understand that none of these items by themselves may be determinative, but you wanna examine all of these items, which may as a whole help your team and your outside counsel determine whether there's a viable claim for fraud or whether or not this is something that's manufactured and there's minimal risk attached. 
So the first thing you want to do is you want to examine the application and origination documents for an indicia of fraud. What does this mean? Well, you, you want to look for mismatched personal identifying information, uh, personal identifiers, or personal information that can actually connect the plaintiff to the origination. Now, this can be a mismatched social security number, an address that's unconnected to the plaintiff, or a primary email that clearly doesn't belong. It should include a review of both underlying applications or the notes or the obligations themselves. We're gonna talk about a case later on that stresses the importance of this type of review and, and essentially found that um, a furnisher in undertaking its reasonable investigation disregarded some of the, the, the clear red flags that existed in the origination documents. And in doing so conducted uh, likely an unreasonable investigation. So the second thing you're going to want to look at is you're going to want to examine account information, right? The account information you have on file. You're going to want to look at the email, the primary telephone, and the billing addresses. You're going to want to look for changes in this information at or near the time of origination. Now, we often find that indicia of fraud can be found in near immediate address changes, credit increases, primary billing changes, such as paperless billing. Now, in and of itself, these items are not going to be conclusive, but it should create various indicia of fraud or non-fraud that allow representatives and you as in-house counsel or your outside counsel to conclude whether or not there's a problem. Third, you're going to want to examine the payment history. Were payments made prior to a fraud dispute? And where possible, you're going to want to track the payment information to the extent available. We have found this to be really effective, particularly where we can track payments through account numbers, or we can tie those payments to bank accounts to, to the actual plaintiff who's making the claims. Now, I, I want to um, encourage you that, that just because someone made a payment uh, prior to a fraud dispute doesn't mean that there was no fraud. Um, and or that someone paid on the account after they had made a fraud dispute doesn't mean that there was no fraud. Sometimes I've found that plaintiffs will make payments on an account even though they're disputing it in order to protect their credit. So it's important, what you're really trying to do is look at, did payments come in prior to the fraud being reported? And if so, let's track those payments and see where they came from, if at all possible. Now, you may need to go through discovery in order to do this, but hopefully your internal systems are good enough to allow you to make this early assessment. Number four, you're going to want to examine the ACDV history. Were there any previous fraud-related disputes submitted? Were there, is there a history of non-fraud or account-related disputes? And this often manifests in challenges to account balances or the timing of payments. So you may see, and, and we see this frequently, someone who uh, indicates or disputes that they were 30 days late or 90 days late, someone who disputes that their, the account balance was wrong. Um, and then it eventually escalates to uh, this account's not mine, or there was ID theft or fraud. Um, it's not determinative, but again, I would say that in those instances, it's an indicia of non-fraud. Where you have disputes that are submitted um, and an ACDV history where there are challenges that have nothing to do with fraud and then it escalates to where a consumer is disputing the fraud, I would say that's an indicia of non-fraud. Next slide, please. So number five, you're gonna wanna pull and examine the call recordings. Um, everybody is on mute right now but I can hear the collective groan in the group. Um, I've heard from clients, do we really need to do this? You know, uh, they're, they're not easily accessible, they're a pain to get, and the answer is, yeah, you do. If you wanna figure out what really happened here and hopefully mitigate the risk, um, it's, it's a step that I think is essential. We've, we have identified and mitigated risks, significant risks, by listening to these call recordings before any discovery ever occurs. We've had cases where clearly the individual calling 
is an entirely different sex, a different age than the account holder. And we've been able to mitigate the issues associated with this evidence by pushing for an early resolution. Or you can, you can try to identify, do we really think that this voice or this person or this call matches up with the plaintiff? Is there a call recording where they talk about the balance, but they, are, they never actually say that it's fraudulent? Those are the types of things that you're going to want to listen for in the call recordings. Um, number six, examine all previous communications and fraud investigations. Was a fraud investigation previously conducted? Was any new information submitted? Were there any conclusions reached? It's, an import, it's important to ensure that you, you make clear there are not any open fraud investigations. At the time of the response, or worse yet, a conclusion of fraud from one department that wasn't available to a reviewer who ultimately confirmed the information as being accurate. That's a, bad, that's a real bad fact case that we actually had. We actually had a client who um, conducted a fraud investigation. Within the notes, there, it is clear that there is an indicia of fraud and a conclusion of fraud, but the reviewer didn't have access to the fraud department notes. It's essential that these reviewers have access to important information and that the departments within your companies are speaking to one another about claims of fraud. This is... Um, a compliance nightmare for, for some and also creates a tremendous amount of litigation risk where this is not done. Um, number seven, you're gonna wanna examine the ACVB attachments, police reports, and fraud affidavits. The details or lack thereof in these documents are important. We'll discuss in a few moments what some of those details look like, but I can tell you from experience that police reports or fraud affidavits, which identify the dates of the fraud or the suspect or specifics of when it was identified um, should be taken seriously. Uh, identity theft and fraud affidavits, which just identify a dozen accounts and simply say, these are not mine, without any real details of how the fraud could have occurred, who could potentially be a suspect, when they discovered it. Um, those don't have the same force because they often look like they're generated from perhaps a credit repair organization. Um, number eight is really, really important, and we've done this with more and more frequency over the years. It's, it's you want to run a people map search or a LexisNexis search or some other type of third party search on the plaintiff and the other relevant third parties. You want to get this report back and you want to compare the phone numbers, the addresses, the email information, the relatives that may be associated with the plaintiff. Most plaintiffs will also provide additional information on cell phone numbers um, and address history, but only if you request it. They're not going to affirmatively give this to you pre-answer, but I can tell you that most of the counsel that I deal with um, when I'm asking to see if I can determine who a plaintiff is or where they live, they, will, they are open to providing this information because they understand the importance of early case assessment. Um, we have used these third party searches to identify plaintiffs who were using aliases to claim fraud and have gotten claims voluntarily dismissed based on these searches and the information that it's led it to. So, so these are really important pieces of information because it's a third party resource that allows you to look at um, where a plaintiff might have lived or, or other important information. Now, I have, to, I have to say that they are not perfect. If there is a claim of true identity theft and fraud, sometimes the third party information, the third party search, people map or Lexus or others will sweep up those fraudulent addresses. So it's important, it's an important piece to the puzzle, but again, it's not determined and you need to complete your entire research and preliminary analysis. Number nine, and finally, you want to examine the previous investigation and the reasons why your team responded in the way that you, they did. You want to understand what specific items the reviewer looked at and how those conclusions were reached. Did they undertake a true fraud investigation or was it some type of superficial review? 
Um, did they listen to those call recordings? And were there things on those call recordings that could have been determinative had they done so? It, it's an important piece of the process to, to both go through and understand whether or not there's fraud, but also understand what your team did and why. Now, once you gather and review this information and complete this checklist, you're gonna be in a much better position to understand the risks and then drive the strategy going forward. Next slide. Now, I, I wanna talk briefly, briefly about some recent ID theft and fraud decisions um, because not surprisingly, these cases are, are highly fact specific. Um, unfortunately, they don't establish bright line rules or guidance on reasonable investigations. However, I think there are a few takeaways that you can take from these decisions. First, I'm confident in saying that simply comparing a consumer's personal identifying information to the information in your file is unlikely to be a reasonable investigation under the FCRA. If I just described your procedures for fraud, changes have to be made. Um, second, it's a very high bar to succeed on summary judgment and establishes that an investigation was reasonable or unreasonable as a matter of law. Therefore, we recommend that clients look for ways to resolve these claims early, if at all possible. It's, it's just, it usually falls to a jury question on whether or not these investigations are reasonable or unreasonable. And we'll see it shortly. Most of the decisions you're going to see are going to be denials of summary judgment. Now, that's not to say that you will, you will never succeed. That is not the point of that. But rather that it's a really, really high bar. We all know that summary judgment is difficult, but I would stress to you that it is even more difficult in, in these cases. I also want to flag that from my review of cases, the utilization of dispute or what's commonly referred to as com compliance condition codes can help to potentially mitigate some risk. Now, these are codes that are often used to flag that a consumer disagrees with the findings and courts have found that it either mitigates the harm or in certain cases satisfies the obligation under the FCRA. So utilization of compliance condition codes can be important. However, I wanna stress there are a number of compliance condition codes that can be used and it's important that you're using them correctly so that you're not creating another issue of potential liability inadvertently. Next slide. So we're gonna talk about just a few cases specifically. Um, in Hopkins, the court denied a furnisher's motion for summary judgment and found that in light of the regulations on uh, the irregularities on the face of the loan documents, that would suggest there was a substantial and unaddressed dispute as to the loan originations. Great Lakes cannot establish that the investigation was reasonable a matter of law. Now, this is a case that highlights the importance of what we just talked about the importance of reviewing the origination documents to look for inaccuracies and inconsistencies that should have raised red flags in your review. And if you found them, right, as part of your preliminary analysis, you'll know that this is probably not a case you're gonna succeed on in summary judgment. And it's probably a case that you should look to resolve early. Um, moving on to the Burns decision, the court again denied the furnisher's motion for summary judgment, finding that its investigation could be unreasonable. Now, in this case, plaintiff was disputing that she signed the subject agreement, but defendant confirmed account information was accurate by comparing the name, the social security number, the date of birth, and the current address to the existing account information. The court essentially found that this review didn't address the substance of the fraud. It goes back to what we talked about earlier. They were claiming that they did not sign the agreement not that their personal identifying information wasn't obtained or used. And it's important to not have a one size fits all or a one review fits all approach to, to addressing these reasonable investigations. In addition, the court held that the defendant's actions could be willful because the fact that the furnisher routinely invokes blanket policies can support a finding of willfulness. It's frightening when you think about the, what could come out of that. Next slide, please. 
Moving on to the Romero decision, the court in this case denied both parties' motions for summary judgment, again, showing that this is a jury question. In denying the furnisher's motion, the court noted that with the exception of asking plaintiff for more documents, it's also clear that Monterey's investigation didn't go beyond the records in its possession. For example, it did not call the detective back that took plaintiff's report of identity theft. This, this case gives me pause, right? Because it seems to suggest that a furnisher may in certain instances um, have to go outside the documents in its possession and obtain additional information. I've had this same fact pattern in a case I've defended before. And after the filing of the complaint, it literally took me three minutes to call a detective and determine that this was a valid claim of fraud perpetrated by the claimant's ex-girlfriend. Now, this case highlights the risks of not taking basic additional steps that could be used to verify fraud. Now, I'll say differently, if you're provided with a detective's name and they're actually investigating it for potential fraud, this is a dispute that you're going to want your team paying extra attention to, and you're going to want to take it seriously. It's not to say that you need to do this for every single ID theft report that you receive. It would again be impossible, but for claims where you know that there's a detective or a plaintiff's counsel is telling you who the detective is in the letter submission that who's investigating it, your team should be prepared to make the call or determine that that is serious enough to delete, modify, or suppress. Now, finally, I wanna flag the Petrus decision. Now, in this case, the furnisher's motion for summary judgment was denied. The court found it was unpersuaded that the defendant was only responsible for investigating whether the account was open fraudulently or without plaintiff's authorization. And while the CRA notified Chase that the plaintiff's dispute pertained to an account fraudulently open, it doesn't mean that the defendant didn't have notice that the plaintiff was also challenging the underlying transaction. This is a tough one, but it highlights one of the earlier points that we were just talking about. Your team must be re trained to review all of the information and the underlying documents to identify the true nature of the type of fraud dispute that's being submitted. Next slide, please. We have our second code. Um, I'm gonna review that for you now. Uh, actually, I'm sorry. I'm gonna review it now and then you'll see it on the next slide. It's 24681. That's 24681 and it will appear on the next slide. Now I wanna spend just a few minutes addressing some questions that are commonly raised. Um, first, a common question that comes up is, can we outsource our reviews? Um, now I, I need to start by saying, I haven't undertaken an extensive review of these third parties or, or the overseas companies that do this. And my comments are only based upon the review of certain examples that have resulted in litigation. So, but with that being said, here's what I have seen. Um, the third party or, or overseas reviews can increase the risk for companies. And, and I have found anecdotally that they just do not appear to be at the same level as in-house reviews. Um, I think additionally, uh, the use of these third party reviewers obviously minimizes direct oversight that your company has over them. And if there are issues and changes to the review process, they're going to be more difficult to implement because they're not on site. Um, so I, I would just suggest that before you decide or before your business decides to try to save money and use um, overseas reviewers or third parties, this may not be the area to do it. Um, these review reviews are so important and the risk is significant. Um, you may end up saving money only to cost you money in the long term. Because it's been my experience that um, these reviewers or these reviews are not up to the standards that other direct um, the companies when they use their own in-house teams um, and how they conduct their reviews. Um, do we need to seek, number two is, do we need to seek information from the originator of the credit or loan? Um, I hate to respond to it in this way, but in summary, it depends. It depends on the nature of the dispute, depends on the nature of the inquiry, and it depends on your industry. 
courts have certainly used the failure to seek information from third parties, such as the originator or the prior servicer, as a factor that can lead to a finding of unreasonableness. But I recognize, again, that this seeking this information from anyone else is going to slow down the process. And it should be reserved for just those elevated types or disputes or ones where information can be obtained easily. And I'm going to use an example that happened relatively recently. Um, I have an auto finance client where uh, the loan was originated through a dealer. Um, at the time, uh, they, they went back or they could have gone back and they would have found that there was an issue in the dealer file itself. They didn't do that. And, and it created potential liability that had they gone back and reviewed the dealer file or asked the dealer um, whether or not they, were, they had questions about this particular transaction, it would have been almost immediately clear that there was. So had they gone back to the originator and you can, you can substitute that originator dealer for, for any other partners that you may have if you're in the credit card space for your retailers, sometimes it may make sense to go back to the originator and see if you can confirm information. It will just tighten up your procedures. If you can do it efficiently and economically, um, you should do that. Third uh, common question that comes up is, can and should we ask consumers for additional information? Previously, clients have asked about the ability to deny um, fraud disputes, confirm the information is accurate, and then seek additional information from consumers. Uh, um, almost as a placeholder. I, I can't stress enough that I do not believe that this is a substitute for a reasonable investigation. You as the furnisher must still conduct a reasonable investigation based on the information that you have in your system or that you can easily obtain as we just discussed. Um, and then you must make a determination. And if it's unclear or there's an indicia of fraud, the response is not to confirm and send a letter. That's not the appropriate response based on the clear language in the statute. If there's an indicia of fraud, the statute's really clear about what you have to do. And if you want to minimize, mitigate and minimize the risk associated with these claims, uh, the, the correct response is to delete, modify, or suppress. Now, if you want to use communications with consumers as a tool, um, that's fine. If you want to give consumers an additional opportunity to submit information that you're going to consider, that's fine. It just can't be used as a substitute for a reasonable investigation. Next slide. And there's our code again, draw your attention down to the bottom. I jumped the gun on it, I apologize, but it's right there, 24681. Um, this question has come up uh, recently in a few different contexts. Do we have to re cease reporting upon receipt of an ID theft or fraud affidavit? Um, this is a question that arises under the submission and consideration of direct reports, but it's come up in the context recently, so I did want to address it. Specifically, the section that we're talking about, 681-2, states that if the consumer submits an ID, ID theft report, the person may not furnish such information unless the person subsequently knows or is inf informed by the consumer that the information is correct. How, however, this does not mean a bare bones submission means you cannot report or that you have to delete an, an entry. Rather, the regulations that are specified here, they, they, I, they actually define and put some parameters around what is an ID theft report. And, and it requires there to be some level of detail. It gives examples of the types of details that should be considered. A bare bones submission saying I've been subject to fraud is not likely to be defined or constitute an ID theft report. So I would urge you to consult these regulations when crafting these policies, because you can set up your system such that it, you can look for additional details, use the examples that are in the regulations um, and, and avoid these types of, types of issues. Um, next slide, please. So how do we avoid these claims, right? So I wanna talk and try to, try to bring, this, bring this together. What steps can we do? Well, the first is to ensure that you have proper compliance on the front end for direct and indirect inquiries and disputes. Um, this is essential. Uh, you can mitigate your risk 
you can minimize these cases if you are undertaking a, a robust review on the, on the front end. Um, ensuring proper compliance in this space, utilizing some of the, the things we talked about in the checklist or all of them as part of your initial review is gonna help minimize the risk and mitigate these claims. The second thing you wanna do is you wanna monitor and confirm ID theft reports and disputes and make sure that they're being escalated. These disputes have a higher level of risk and they should be treated as such. Um, you know, when we're setting up policies and procedures for clients, we often have these reviews as, as perhaps a multi-layered review. You know, you could have an initial fraud review or fraud investigation um, and, and then you can uh, escalate it to a manager. Um, that's something that you should consider and it, and, it, and it treats these claims with the level of risk that, that they generate. Um, third, uh, flag attorney letters and track filings. When an attorney submits a dispute or pre-litigation demand to you, pay attention to who it's coming from and how often these claims result in lawsuits. You can be heading off some of these disputes at a pre-litigation stage. Oftentimes I'll get a litigation file or I'll get an account file and I'll see that the guy that just sued them had sent either a pre-litigation demand or was the attorney that submitted the original dispute. If there's an attorney that's submitting a dispute to the CRAs, this person's serious. doesn't mean you always give them you know, what they're looking for. It just should trigger a heightened level of review. And particularly if you know that they're the type of attorney that vets their clients know who's sending these letters because you know if it's francis and mailman or others who do a good job of submitting and vetting their clients you may know that you want to attach more importance to those dispute letters or the pre-litigation demands conversely you should also be identifying what do the credit repair organization letters look like how do we know if, if this is coming from a credit repair organization and maybe that's something i'm not going to say put less importance on it but it can be a factor. The fourth um, step to avoiding these claims is document the investigation, not just the procedures. This is an important step in the review process. You should be implementing policies and procedures and documenting what steps your reviewers took, what documents they may have reviewed for each review. And you can do this whether in a notes description or in a checklist that the reviewers click off but it's much better to provide your outside counsel with specified documents that have been, that show what a reviewer actually looked at for this investigation, rather than just what the policy is generally. It's difficult to go to a plaintiff's counsel and say, here's our policy, and I'm sure that the reviewer followed this policy. It's a lot better to have a business record that you can submit and admit as part of the court proceeding that says, this is what this reviewer did. This document was created in real time and it's a business record and it shows what they did. It'll help your reviewer refresh their recollection if they're deposed. It's a good way if you can build it into your system, whether it's quick notes or a checklist of what they've looked at, something to document what they did for that particular review. Um, and finally, this is an issue that's coming up and we're, we're, we're currently working through it. I'm not sure I have a great answer for it, but I can tell you what we're thinking about. So one of the, the issues that's continuing to repeat itself in these claims is issues of familial or relationship fraud. This is where I'm sure that those of you who practice in the space have dealt with this, where a family member, a roommate, a spouse, an ex-girlfriend or boyfriend is the alleged fraudster. Um, these are really difficult cases for clients because oftentimes, you know, billing statements are getting sent to the address where they have the family member or the person, um, the relative who lives there. And it's really difficult to ferret these out. And it's frustrating because, you know, uh, someone's mother or their, their sibling could have opened up an account that you're going to have to waive. And then on top of it, their brother or their sister are saying, you also have to pay me a significant amount of money because um, you know, I've been damaged. So we are currently discussing strategies to pursue or potentially pursue family members of, of, as a means of dissuading these claims. Now I bring this up to plaintiff's counsel where I know 
who the alleged fraudster is, if it's the mother. And I frequently will say as part of the settlement discussions, well, you know, we're going to have to just bring the mother in. We're going to have to third party the mother in. And, and oftentimes it will be met with a, well, that doesn't discharge your obligations. And they're right, right? So just because we're going to third party the mother doesn't mean that we're ultimately not going to be liable, but it may dissuade the plaintiff from pursuing. It's not something that we put into practice. It's just something that we're considering um, for those clients who want to be extra aggressive on these claims because they're just frustrated. They're frustrated with these types of claims and they're frustrated at how frequently they're seeing them. Um, next slide. So before we wrap up, I just, we have a couple of questions that I wanted to address. Um, we'll try to get through those briefly. Um, the first is, you know, what are the settlement ranges that we frequently see um, for these cases? It's a great question. Um, generally speaking for run of the mill, ID theft, fraud claims, where we think there is some potential fraud and some mitigating factors against fraud or supporting the conclusions, we can usually get these resolved for between 10 and $15,000, depending on who we're dealing with. Um, we've had others where there are bad facts that were partially disclosed or uh, where we were still holding them in pre-discovery and we paid quite a bit more. Um, I think the most we ever paid to resolve these claims were, were somewhere between 65 and 85 thousand. Um, but those cases are usually the outlier. And I think it really what drives the settlement um, amounts is going to be whether or not there's actual damages, um, which these cases can throw off. But you can, you can frequently get up to pretty significant numbers, but for run-of-the-mill cases where, you know, there are probably some facts on both sides and your pre-discovery and pre-answer, you know, some, some of the plaintiff's counsel will settle in that initial range. Um, the second question uh, is, have you ever considered or used expert testimony in these cases? Um, it's an interesting question. It's something that we've certainly considered and continue to look at, um, but we haven't used yet. And it's not something that I've frankly seen plaintiff's counsel or defense counsel frequently pursuing for these cases. Um, I think there are a couple factors for that. Uh, first is that the experts are expensive um, and increase the cost of litigation. Um, the second is, is that it's not clear that ex expert testimony on the reasonableness of, of an investigation is something that's either capable or appropriate for expert testimony. Um, but it's something that, you know, certainly we're looking into and considering. It's just not something that we used before. Um, third, uh, are there any issues that you're currently monitoring or trending? Um, yeah, these are a couple things outside of uh, identity theft and fraud. Um, we're seeing an uptick uh, on bankruptcy related claims. Uh, we've noticed some of the plaintiff's bar bringing claims um, that furnishers have failed to zero out um, a balance uh, on a, a bankruptcy um, discharge. For those accounts that have been discharged, they're failing to zero out the balance. Um, there's been an uptick in those claims. Uh, but we usually cite there was a good case out of the, I think it was the Western District of Wisconsin that dealt with this um, and essentially found about a year ago that all of the courts that consider this were, um, uh, have rejected it. Uh, that's something that we're seeing. Another trend that we're monitoring is, I recently heard that um, clients are receiving letters asked uh, from from uh, the consumers asking them to remove uh, dispute or compliance condition codes that have been attached. Um, so previously, you may remember three to four years ago, uh, lawsuits were being generated based upon the failure to apply these codes. Now what I'm seeing is clients are receiving letters and disputes that are being submitted about the removal of these codes. Um, and I'm finding that certain clients are not set up when they receive a letter, a direct communication that that issue is no longer in dispute, their process is not set up to remove that dispute code, which creates potential inaccuracy. I'm concerned that this is being driven by some of the creative plaintiff's counsel um, who, who, who practice in the space. And so it's something for that we're gonna continue to monitor and it's something that you should check in with your credit reporting teams if they are getting any disputes or direct consumer communications from consumers about the removal of those dispute codes. Um, so I think that's all we have for today. 
Uh, if I didn't get to your question, I will try to email you separately if there's anything else that comes in. I hope there were a couple of things that you gathered from today's webinar, um, but this is gonna conclude today's session. Remember to keep an eye out for the follow-up email, which will include the links to the program, materials, the checklist that we talked about today, a recording and the CLE survey. Thanks so much for joining us and we really appreciate your time.